Hello and welcome to this critical care teaching video where today we're going to cover initiation and the troubleshooting of invasive ventilation. We'll start by looking at the correct mode of ventilation for your patient, what the initial settings should be, and then we'll move on to titrating these settings to your ABG results. We'll talk about recruiting lung tissue and minimising atelectasis, and we'll touch on the topic of alarms. So what mode of ventilation is the correct one for your patient? Well, there is no such thing as the ideal mode of invasive ventilation. When we talked about ventilator-induced lung injury, we talked about the fact that invasive ventilation is not physiological and it is potentially damaging for your patient. The correct mode of ventilation for your patient is the one that works best for them, putting them in the best state physiologically with the least risk. Bear in mind, there is great safety to be found in familiarity. Have a think about what ventilation mode the majority of patients in your intensive care unit are receiving right now. When you're picking the correct mode of ventilation for your patient, firstly, have a look at the history of that patient. Are they a post-operative elective patient, perfectly healthy, no history of lung pathology? You're going to treat them very differently from an acute admission from the emergency department who has severe pneumonia on a background of COPD. Also have a look at drug cards and anaesthetic charts. It's pretty clear that you're going to need to use a mandatory mode of ventilation for a patient who's just received a neuromuscular blocking drug or perhaps a patient who's been admitted with an opiate overdose and has severe respiratory depression. So what should those initial settings be? Well, tidal volume of around six mils per kilo ideal body weight and inspiratory pressure delivering that kind of tidal volume and keeping driving pressures down below 14 centimeters of water. Typically in respiratory rates between 12 and 16 breaths per minute are adequate for the vast majority of patients. And the IE ratio on your ventilator will probably default to one to two, but values anything between one to one and one to two are usually reasonable starting points for most patients. The amount of oxygen you give to the patient, whatever is appropriate for the pathology you're seeing in front of you. So how about titrating the settings on your ventilator to the results you're getting on your arterial blood gases? Let's look at CO2 first. Most sedated and invasively ventilated patients do not need to have a CO2 within the reference range. This is known as permissive hypercapnia, where we go about targeting a pH greater than 7.2 rather than any arbitrary figure of PaCO2. This allows us to use lower tidal volumes and lower inspiratory pressures, and therefore is a routine part of trying to avoid ventilator-induced lung injury. This is sometimes called lung protective ventilation or low tidal volume ventilation. The risk of hypercapnia though isn't always safe. CO2s should be kept much more tightly controlled and certainly within reference ranges for patients with head injury and pregnant patients. So if your CO2 is high and it's affecting the pH of your patient or for whatever reason needs to be much more tightly controlled and down within the reference range, then you need to increase the minute ventilation. You can do this in a number of different ways. You can increase the respiratory rate on the ventilator, you can increase the tidal volume, or if you're using a constant pressure generating mode such as BiPAP or pressure control ventilation, you can increase the inspiratory pressure to deliver that higher tidal volume. If you've got a low CO2, the opposite of the above. How about oxygen then? Well, the simple answer is you increase or decrease the FiO2 as required, but I'd encourage you to think beyond that. Why is your patient hypoxemic despite a high oxygen? What can you do to improve that pathology? That might be antibiotics, it could be a therapeutic bronchoscopy, it could simply be a matter of waiting. And how can you minimise atelectasis? Atelectasis is a near universal problem for ventilated patients. Just go and have a look at the CT scans and chest x-rays of ventilated patients on your intensive care unit. Almost all of them will have a degree of atelectasis. I would encourage you to start by treating the obvious problems. Is a main airway obstructed by a plug of sputum? If so, get the bronchoscope out, ask the physiotherapist for help and try and remove that. 
Is there a huge pleural effusion causing collapse of a whole lung? Drain it. Give the lung some space to work. This brings us on to the topic of lung recruitment, and this is sometimes controversial. Some authorities see it as absolutely vital in the care of ventilated patients as part of avoiding atelectasis, and others see it as potentially very dangerous. There are many different methods proposed for how you should go about recruiting lung, and there are pros and cons to all of them. We'll have a look at some of these now. One of the old methods that I was taught when I first started training was the so-called 40 for 40, application of a sustained high pressure for a prolonged period, which was typically 40 centimetres of water pressure for 40 seconds. This would overcome that initial high pressure required to reopen collapsed lung tissue. Just think of how hard you have to blow into a balloon to get it to start inflating. Then set the peep just slightly higher than it was pre that recruitment manoeuvre that peep will hopefully hold the lung open and stop it collapsing again. But bear in mind, this is a pretty significant shock to the lungs. And if you go doing studies on it, doing bronchoalveolar lavages, you can wash out quite an inflammatory soup from the lungs of patients that have been subjected to lung recruitment in this way. And it will have an effect on the venous return to the heart and therefore cardiac output and that can cause quite a significant drop in cardiac output, blood pressure, and in a vulnerable patient could even cause cardiac arrest. If you're going to do something like this, make sure you can see the monitor, make sure you can see the blood pressure in the ECG trace before you start. Another method of doing things is to have a look at the lower inflection point on the volume pressure curve. Most ventilators will allow you to create a loop, a flow volume loop or a volume pressure loop, and you can use the data from that loop to set your peep. The lower inflection point marks the point at which there is a great, much greater increase in volume delivered to the patient for a small increase in pressure. You need to set your peep slightly above that lower inflection point to try and hold lung open. But bear in mind, Lung tissue that's been collapsed for some time may require much longer periods with higher pressures to get it to reopen. Once it's reopened, you can often hold the lung open with lower PEEP, but you do need to apply higher pressure for a longer period of time, which is one of the advantages of the so-called 40 for 40 method of doing things. Another thing you can do is stepwise titration of your PEEP and your inspiratory pressure whilst keeping driving pressure the same. Quick reminder, driving pressure is your inspiratory pressure minus your PEEP. You then go about slowly reducing PEEP and inspiratory pressure, again keeping driving pressure the same, looking for a point at which your patient starts to desaturate, or there's a sudden drop in compliance as measured by your ventilator. These are markers of atelectasis recurring. You then go about repeating the whole process again and when you're coming back down the other side of the ladder, you set peak just above that point with a desaturated or compliance dropped. This image demonstrates that in process. You can see the difference between peep and inspiratory pressure, the driving pressure, is kept the same pretty much throughout the entire ladder. And they both are incrementally increased in a stepwise fashion, keeping the patient on that increase for about 10 minutes before making the next step all the way up to really quite high pressures. And then coming back down the other side is when you start looking for that change in saturation or that change in lung compliance. But just take a look at the time axis here. This is a process that takes a considerable quantity of time and considerable investment from you, the clinician at the bedside. It is not a quick fix, but the evidence from trials suggests that using this kind of method subjects the lungs to less uh, inflammatory processes, less stress, and is potentially therefore safer. One seemingly ideal method of individualizing PEEP for your patient is to measure their transpulmonary pressure. This is the difference between the pressure within the alveolus and the pressure within the pleural space. If you can maintain a positive transpulmonary pressure, 
you can maximize lung recruitment for your patient and you can prevent atelectasis. But this does require special pieces of kit. Typically, an NG tube with a balloon that sits behind the heart is placed and that is connected to a pressure transducer and that gives you your intrapleural pressure. Esophageal pressure here being used as the surrogate for intrapleural pressure. You can then titrate PEEP to get a constantly positive transpulmonary pressure and help prevent collapse and atelectasis. Many modern ventilators come with the ability to do this. Finally, a more old fashioned way of doing things is to use a PEEP to FiO2 ladder. And this gives a rough guide of a PEEP that you should be using depending on the oxygen requirements of your patient, such that higher oxygen requirements need higher levels of PEEP. And this formed a part of many trials of invasive ventilation within intensive care for many years, but it has somewhat fallen out of favour in preference for individualised titration of PEEP. Finally then, let's look at alarms. When you set your patient up on a ventilator, you've got to consider the safe limits for your patient. What's the safe tidal volume for this patient? What's the safe peak pressure for this patient? Bear in mind that lung compliance, the respiratory system compliance is going to change over time. And therefore, safe alarm limits will help minimize the risk to your patients because you will get an early warning that compliance is changing. And therefore, your minute ventilation, peak pressures, plateau pressures, tidal volumes, they are changing. So in this video, We've covered some suggested initial settings for invasive ventilation that should work for most patients. We've looked at how you can titrate your ventilator settings to your arterial blood gas results. And we've touched on the subject of lung recruitment and the setting of PEEP. We've also highlighted the importance of setting alarms correctly for your patients too. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you do have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And I hope to see you on the next one.